we're going to talk about how curves are really polygons or yet another link between the continuous and discrete. There's a lot of those. And we're going to start with a nice and simple one. And as in the last talk, n, big N, is going to denote a specific fixed infinitely large integer, also called hyperinteger, or rather hypernatural. which has the property of being unlimited, larger than one, two, three, and any standard number. And epsilon is its reciprocal. For the whole talk, they will denote that specific infinite number to denote that it really is kind of arbitrary. We're gonna use this sort of hyper perspective to look at of hopefully familiar theorem, the intermediate value theorem, which I set up in the specific form of the unit interval rather than arbitrary one, but doesn't really matter. And specifically, if we have a function from a closed interval into the reals, if it is continuous and we set it up so that its left endpoint, f of zero, is below zero, and its right endpoint, f of one, is greater than zero, then at some point there must be some point c where f is equal to zero. But we're going to do this in kind of a wild way, radically elementary way. Specifically, we're going to map everything over into the non-standard domain. And then we're going to take the entire interval, the unit interval, and discretize it. Specifically, look at the bottom left where the numbers 0 and 1 are written on a green line with lots of tick marks on it. The idea is that we can cut this interval into n pieces. And because n is some fixed infinite integer, and I had already given a name to its reciprocal, which is the length of each piece epsilon. So we've taken an interval and we've cut it up into an unlimited number of pieces, but the whole point is that the number of pieces is some specific fixed number. And so for most purposes, it's as if we had just cut it into like, I don't know, five pieces in that it's just as easy to manipulate with symbols, but it can perfectly describe a whole interval and not just some finite set. And most importantly, this gives us a last piece for things, by which I mean, you can now give a definite answer to questions like, at least in principle, of questions like, okay, what is the last time in this discretization where the function was less than zero or greater than one or really any real value? It lets you keep track of something that would be impossible to keep track of in just the standard real numbers. And we're going to do this by marching through the values of f1 epsilon at a time. By hypothesis, f of 0 is some value less than 0. And because 0 is a standard number, its image is also some standard number. Then we march forward by one epsilon, and we look at f of epsilon. Because f is assumed to be continuous, continuity means that if two points are infinitely close, then their images must be infinitely close. The idea being that continuity cannot pull apart points that are close by. So while we have no idea what f of epsilon is, we know that it will be infinitely close to zero. And f of two epsilon will also be infinitely close and so on. Actually, in fact, for any standard number n. Could you say a word about how you, I mean, you're evaluating f on epsilon, but it's in principle only defined on 
real numbers. Oh, right, the extension. Yeah. Okay. Sure, sure thing. It's because I'm making a conflation on purpose here. And here's the conflation. But really, I'm looking at... Actually, I even wrote it out. I should have set it up, though. F star. Where you consider whatever formula can define F. And because that formula will ultimately be formed out of the basic arithmetic symbols and other symbols in some logical language, all of them can be interpreted in terms of these new numbers. And so you can consider every function of a natural extension. And the extension is unique. Okay. Which is why you end up just saying f and f star are the same thing. Mm -hmm. No, they're not. But you're essentially enlarging f. Although it is important to keep track of which is which sometimes if you're trying to use one specifically F star to approximate, say, F. That will come up in a bit. But for now, okay. The idea being that for all finitary relations, being infinitely close to something is an equivalence relation. And so applying any standard number of operations, except by dividing by infinitesimals, cannot get you out of the infinitesimal realm. You need to take some unlimited number of steps. However many that is. So you can never find the point at which one infinitesimal neighborhood of a standard point, say A, ends, and another one begins. That is impossible. But you're using it to your advantage in a way, so it's all right. So this will keep marching up to say f of what is that big n minus one epsilon and finally f of n epsilon which is just one and then there's this unbounded middle bit of an unlimited number of pieces nonetheless each piece has some definite value and so there are quote finitely many of them where the word finite is doing a lot of heavy lifting, like a lot. And so you could say there's some last time where the function was less than zero. There is, because the function is less than zero. It started out less than zero by assumption. And it's not zero at the end, it's f of one, which is given to be strictly greater than zero. But this last time where it's less than zero, what is it? we call it h. And now this is the piece we want. This is the point that will be at zero. And I can't hear anyone else. Daniel, are you there? Well, I'm here. Oh. OK, cool. Yeah, I think you're the only one here. So it just gets really quiet otherwise. I can hear you fine. Cool. So there's a the last piece where this function is less than zero. After this, it will be strictly greater than zero. But it, can, it has to go from strictly less than zero to strictly greater than zero by infinitesimal increments, which means that it has to be within the infinitesimal neighborhood of zero in the first place. So let's say this is like negative epsilon or something, and this would be positive epsilon. That means if you take its standard part, this gives you the candidate point, and we can just work that out by calculation right here now. Specifically, the property of being continuous is equivalent to a function commuting with its standard part. The C we wanted is given to be the standard part of this thing. So we just plug it in. Yeah? Yes. 
Actually, no. F star of ST, because the standard part will take every... Yeah. There. Thanks. As you can see, playing... Yeah, sure. At least to unif no to regular continuity actually, yeah. So given this I can I swap them. I know that this thing is some value that's infinitely close to zero. And so its standard part well it has to be zero, because zero is the only standard value that in pure infinitesimals can round to. So I'm using the continuity of F to sort of glue each little mesh piece together and string them along as the sort of infinitesimal gunk. And any discrete number of pieces of it essentially just coheres together in a single point. What I mean being like any standard N or fine limited N times epsilon is will not escape being infinitely close to zero. It cannot jump to the next level of being appreciable, to being an actual, uh, yeah, to being appreciable. And this is really useful. Because I can use one piece and then sort of extend along to figure out things about other pieces in this really discrete way, but I'm making a continuous argument. And whenever you can do this, you should be able to transfer between discrete and continuous arguments, which often leads to surprising connections. Cool. Questions? Yeah. yeah. Like the number of pieces is going to go one, two, three, all the way up to n. It's just that n is unlimited, but it will go all the way up there. It's infinitely big and yet still. The next slide might clarify this a little bit because this idea of the last part is, I would say we're the unique part of all of this. Because typically with infinitary arguments, you don't really get to say that because it's a pretty def it's a defining feature of being finite, really. Oh, damn, I didn't have that slide. Oh, well. In that case. It's a little personal board, after all. Oh. You guys see this board? Cool. Okay. Don't get me. This is mildly aggravating. Fine. Can you see? All right, then. The big idea at work here is essentially compactification. The idea that making something bigger can make it smaller in a useful sense. Like, let's start simple. Just compactifying an open interval into a closed one. Even though it has strictly more points, like, okay, fine, not strictly more in cardinality. You've added points, but nonetheless, the object has become somewhat simpler. Because it is compact. And now you can, for example, give it finite covering by definition, which is pretty useful, whereas the open interval, no, you could have clusters that build up off at the endpoints. 
you can do a form of just like because I'm about to do because to do a compactification of a kind of different sort, but the similar idea of add points to make it simpler. I'll just look at the positive half of the line. Okay, there. So the left segment that I just circled here, that one is the standard natural numbers the ones you're familiar with and find so useful. The middle dot, dot, dot is the sort of transition between the initial and unlimited segments. N is that same fixed infinite integer we fixed at the very beginning of the talk. And the idea is that I've just picked some point somewhere in the unlimited segment where in the segment really doesn't matter. And I've just said, okay, it stops here. So it contains this whole standard unlimited thing, but nonetheless, I've given it an end. I can count down from it, n, n minus one, n minus two, all the way down to zero. So I can do induction on it, which is very useful. It essentially gives a, another way of thinking about infinity, but that's a whole rabbit hole for another time. This is very similar. This is, I think, I think they're about equivalent. This is essentially a nicer version of it. Since it just lets you use your intuitions about numbers, which tend to be pretty well developed in well, really anybody. Okay. We're going to now use this to illustrate part of the Jordan curve theorem. I'd hoped to do the whole theorem, but it turned out that was too ambitious. But that's all right, because the part we're going to illustrate is still pretty wild. The Jordan curve theorem. Given some curve C, which for the moment I'll just draw like this, but as we'll see, these are not the problematic curves for proving the statement. It's an injective function from a circle the unit interval mod one. So you identify the endpoints, which is equivalent to this condition that C of zero be equal to C of one. And simple means that it has no self intersections, no loops. Yeah. Then, Several things are true. Specifically, the, the plane is split by this curve into two regions called outside and inside, which are both open sets. Outside is unbounded as well as you hope it was. Open, unbounded. It is path connected, but not simply connected because, well, Inside is the hole and outside. Open unbounded path connected. Oh, and inside. Also open, however, it is bounded. And it is simply path connected. And, oh, and the common boundary of outside and inside is C, the curve. Proving this theorem is famously long, and the proofs I know of are over 100 pages. 
now since putting this together, I've seen slicker proofs. There's even one that's just a page long, but it requires a bunch of machinery up front, like the Brower fixed point theorem. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Although ever since doing all the hyper real stuff, I've yet another, what is it? Discrete continuous analog, Spurner's lemma and Brouwer six point theorem, that their equivalent becomes way more obvious. Okay. So the, Sperner's, Sperner's lemma. It's like a discrete version, specifically about coloring the triangulations, but not today. Okay. Right. Okay. Our plan, of which we are going to be doing the first one. I'll show what the last one looks like, just the picture, because it's really bizarre to think about and really cool, but I will not have time for it. Most of this will be in the first one in particular, showing that we can remove self-intersections in the approximation. All right. So we're going to use a similar trick. Working with the squiggly thing to represent C for the moment. By the way, curves like these are not the reason proving this theorem is a problem. The problem is when you have curves that are weird fractals, curves of positive areas, space filling, that sort of thing. Then it becomes way less obvious that a closed curve splits some, the plane into inside and outside. Okay, so first we make yet another identification and we look at C star instead, essentially the infinitesimally thickened C. Whatever, since C is the image of some functions, specifically a parameterization because it's supposed to map a circle. Okay, so it's defined by some formula. It's Because it's a function, it's definable in whatever the underlying language is. And so if you take that underlying formula and you extend all the underlying operations, you will get the extension of the function C, which itself has some graph which you can embed inside of r2 star you get a f i think it still works because you can pick you can pick the values of it by the ax like a weaker form of the axiom of choice, dependent choice. Yes. Yes, always. Yep. And now considering this sort of second outer curve will prove to be pretty useful. For one, we can do this similar trick we did with the intermediate value theorem, but now in a circle, and justifying the title of the talk of curves or polygons, actually, of all those tiny dots I drew. Okay, we, we take a circle, we mesh it infinitesimally to pieces, exactly n pieces as before, each of length epsilon, and then we look at the image of C star. 
at all of them. And this will give us some polygon, which actually, even if the original, though the original curve is not intersecting since we were given that it was simple and injective, and since being injective is a first order property, C star is also injective. Uh, all right, the approximating polygon or hyper polygon, or polygon with a hyper finite number of sides where the side lengths are all infinitesimals. It just looks like smooth curves. We're going to use it to mesh this object. And then basically by assuming the Jordan curve theorem for polygons, which I am going to assume on the grounds that, that the finite Jordan curve theorem for just ordinary polygons, given that one, you can use it to get the full thing by using this approximating polygon. If the curve is C is smooth instead and just not arbitrarily continuous, I think even if it's just uniformly continuous, then you could just use the hyperfinite polygon to exact, not just to approximate it, but just to represent it. And then it will just follow from the Jordan curve theorem for polygons automatically by the transfer principle. This is like the, like this is the part where the discrete thing suggests the continuous thing and do it a few times and what transfer, what becomes what becomes much clearer. Yet another layer of confusion stripped away. Anyway. This is vertices. So the issue is that this approximating polygon can have self intersections even if the curve doesn't. And if you go on math stack exchange, someone said that Camille Jordan's original proof, this was exactly the main difficulty of showing that you can reduce the number of self intersections somehow while approximating. Well, we're not approximating. Or actually rather we, we're using a perfect approximation and we fixed it once and for all time at the very beginning. And now we're just going to play with it. Specifically this, Okay, like an overcomplete approximation, a sort of hyperfined one, because it's standard part, it's just the original object that you're approximating. But there's other stuff too. Okay. Here's the thing that if we want to remove the loops, but because the number of pieces is finite, we can just count down. And here's an example. Okay, say I have these vertices, let's say. A, A plus one, A plus one denoting the numbering of the vertices. At this point, this problem can be treated basically like a graph problem, which is why I'm not even bothering to write like C of A plus one. I'm just really all I'm concerned about this sort of combinatorial ordering and their distances from each other. That's it. A, A plus one. B, B plus one, going into this way. Pick specifically so that there'd be a self-intersection, which there is at that red point right there. And so looking at it combinatorially, the edges A to A plus one intersects the edge from B to B plus one and we want to correct this defect, but we can. Specifically, if we look at adding potential edges from the A plus one to B plus one, or from A to B, the shorter one of these two can never be longer than the paths B, B plus one and A, A plus one by the triangle inequality. And so don't care. Because here's the thing, I have a sort of insulation 
like okay so that's C like actual C not just the star and this like points around it is supposed to be the it's monad star in phantasmal neighborhood etc it's like there's an eps it's like there's an epsilon bubble protecting me from any standard point aka a, this epsilon calculation overflows and becomes appreciable as long as i can stay stuck to or infinitely close to this curve it doesn't really matter if i'm inside or outside it because i'm closer to it than to anything else and uniquely associated with it which is also quite useful because not having to care about whether you're inside or outside at least at the beginning is pretty damn handy so, so i can just take the shorter one of these two, which is in this case from A plus one to B plus one. And I can just delete the vertices, sorry, the edges that originally connected that. So that would be that one's gone and that one's gone. Oh, and I don't even need B then. I can just delete it as well. The orientation in which deletions are performed and specifically will depend on, oh, another fact. If Note this. Say you have two vertices, A and B, which are both infinitely close to each other. The overall picture of what that looks like on the, pol uh, on the curve is like this. Like two points that are right next to each other, and then a whole great big polygon. And those two points divide this polygonal approximation, this hyperfinite approximation of it, into two arcs an infinitesimal arc and an arc that's not infinitesimal, because the overall curve is not infinitesimal. And the reason I bring this up is. The specific path you want to delete to remove self-intersection, the orientation of which you delete in, you always want to be deleting from the infinitesimally close ones and not going the long way around because you'll then accidentally <laughs> delete most of the graph, which you don't want. This procedure is actually not even guaranteed to reduce the number of self-intersections since I forget how exactly at this point, but it can introduce new ones. But the thing is that it is guaranteed to converge because you can just keep doing it because the number of pieces is finite, where finite is hyperfinite. So I can just count down this procedure until it is a simple closed curve or a simple polygon. So I've removed the self-intersections by doing the most, like doing the most naive thing in the most clever way possible. And this takes up many more pages in the core of the proof. Other, there's another bit I wanted to show. This one I did not get to, but I want to just highlight what a strange picture it is. Specifically, claim four, the way to do this is that, okay, yeah, like the world's, what is it, like the world's ultimate Lego or Tinker Toy grid, man, your, your son would love these things, yeah, so yeah, it's a polygon that colors this whole thing in, but it never intersects itself. And it also never touches the boundary. It's bounded away from it. It's just in the interior. And so that's how you can use it to prove that the inside is path connected and simply connected because from any points A and B, there's always a path. And because you can, you can sort of rasterize the whole thing by epsilon. Oh, what's the word for it? You skin the whole thing. You take epsilon layers and you add a curve and you. 
And because each layer will shave it down by an epsilon factor. And so you'll get all the way to the middle and that's how you prove it's contractible and therefore simply connected. But you're also doing that in the most naive, yeah, also doing in the most naive but clever way possible. You just do the obvious thing. It just just look at it one at a time. Just shave it. Another clever thing the proof did is, oh, this one. I just want to give credit to the author for this. To prove this, he just proved the case for inside to get all the claims for outside. You can apply because it's in the plane and therefore can be identified with the complex numbers. You can just perform a circle inversion to swap inside and outside and by continuity of the inversion and conformality and all that, get whatever you wanted. Okay, you were saying? 